Hello parents, my name is Randy Stafford. I'm the high school physics teacher here at Rome High. And if you're watching this, chances are that one of your children is enrolled in my class. Uh, students, if you're watching this, you're welcome to. There's no secrets here. I'm not telling your parents anything I haven't told you. But this is really, this video is aimed at them. So you're welcome to watch or you're welcome to fast forward right past it. Whatever you'd prefer is fine with me. Parents, we're going to do an experiment in my classroom over the next couple of weeks that I'm calling the Grand Experiment. We're going to flip my classroom. Now, classroom flipping is probably not a term that you're used to, so I want to kind of explain it to you just to let you know what's going on with your children. Um, and to do that, I want to point out uh, some differences between our kids and you and I. Um, I have three children of my own, one's in middle, one's in high school, and one's in college, so my guess is that we're roughly the same age. When you were I, you and I were in school, we would typically go into class, sit in nice, neat little rows. The teacher would come in, would talk for the entire hour. We would diligently take notes. Then we'd go home and we'd do the homework with various degrees of success. But that was the model. Well, our children are not good at uh, paying that kind of monolithic attention. They've just, their brains are wired differently. And, and that is really because they have been raised differently than you and I were. Uh, when we were kids, um, our external input, uh, electronic external input, came from television. And in my town, there were three TV stations. They were on from about 6 a.m. till about 11 p.m. And the closest thing we had to remote control was when my dad would say, go change to Channel 8, and I'd run up there and go click, 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 click over to Channel 8. And that just does not describe our children. Our children are the screen generation. They are used to iPods and iPads and laptops and smartphones and everything else you can imagine. And that has caused their brains to be wired differently than ours. Let me give you an example. I need to give two examples. One is my children. Uh, about two weeks or so ago, um, I was in the living room. I had the TV on. I was watching a movie and kind of pretending to grade papers. Really, I was just grading them whenever the commercials came on. Uh, my son, the 16-year-old, is sitting off to my right. He's got his laptop open on his desk. He's playing some online war game with his buddies. In his right ear, he's got an earbud attached to his iPod listening to his music, but he's also paying attention to the movie because we comment about it. Off to my left is my college-age daughter. Her laptop open. She's on Pinterest, and uh, both ears are listening to the movie, but with both hands, she is sending texts back and forth with somebody of hers from college. Well, if that wasn't enough input for them, uh, at one point they both burst out laughing and I asked what was funny because the movie certainly wasn't funny at that time. And as it turns out, in addition to everything else, they were on um, Facebook um, chatting back and forth between the two of them, 15 foot away, and they're chatting on Facebook. So our children are wired differently than us. Let me give you another example that happened in class a week or two ago. It had been my intention to um, show a couple of videos. We were working on some electrostatic problems, uh, Coulomb's law problems, don't worry what that is, but um, I found a video, a couple of videos on YouTube, where some high school teacher had kind of worked out all the steps on a couple of really good problems, and I thought it would be good for the kids. So I was intending to show it. Well, unfortunately, we were having some internet issues that day, and I couldn't show it. So instead, I worked the problems out myself, and I remembered enough of the details to where I worked the exact same problems out as the ones I was going to show on video. The next day, uh, internet's fine, and so I decided that I was going to just play the videos anyway, um, really to kind of help clear up some questions I had in my mind about how students nowadays process information. I played the videos. They were the exact same problems that I had worked the day before. By the end of the day, I had a, maybe a half dozen students who said something akin to, Mr. Stafford, this is so much more clear now that you've shown us these YouTube videos. How come you can't teach it as clearly as the man on the tape? Well, I tried not to get offended. Um, it turns out that they're just used to, conditioned to get their information off of screens. Let me also say that when I was explaining the problem, I kept having to stop to do discipline. You know, you guys stop talking and yes, you can go to the bathroom and please get back in your chair, that kind of thing. When I showed the problems on YouTube, the students stared straight ahead like little zombies and watched the guy work out the problem. So I do believe they're wired differently and rather than fight it, I've chosen to embrace it. Let me tell you what a flipped classroom is. In a normal classroom, I, I'm the guy that understands physics, 
to, to whatever extent, and it is my job to disseminate that information to your students. So typically the, the period, our periods are 15 minutes long, typically um, in class time I give them information. Unfortunately, it comes down to me either talking the whole time or maybe talking and letting them do a little sample problem or something, but, but I'm kind of the sage on the stage. I, I don't, that, that is a term that flipped classrooms uses because it's a bad thing. I don't want to be the expert. I want to help your students be the expert. So during the period, I disseminate the information. Then I send them home and I say work, you know, the first 10 homework problems. At home is where they do the application. Well, here's what will happen. They'll work the first one and it goes pretty good because it's roughly identical to the way it looked on the sample problem I did in class. And then when they get to the second one, uh, it's a little different. They study it for 20 or 30 seconds, slam their physics book home, pick their phone up, send a text to a buddy that says, you know, Mr. Stafford's so hard, why is physics got to be so tough? Well, a flipped classroom, we switch the roles around. Homework becomes information. This video I'm making is the first of many uh, that will teach the lessons. That is, rather than take class time to explain the lessons, I'm going to do what the guy did on YouTube. I'm going to teach my lesson and commit it to videotape, post that to my website, and then uh, from there they will be able to watch it, your students will be able to watch it at their convenience. I anticipate that it will be a great savings of time in that it takes me the entire period to teach a lesson because I'm doing all this discipline along the way. But I won't have that issue on the video. Your students can watch the video and learn what I'm teaching. In addition to that, if they don't hear or misunderstand or whatever, they can watch it again or back up and see it in a little spot. Plus, it will free up the ability for me to do a number of uh, sample problems, many more than I'd be able to do in class. So the information will happen at home. Now, the class time will be spent on application. That is, what we'll do during class time is we will work sample problems, we will do labs, we will extend the knowledge so that if they have problems, the guy who kind of understands the subject can go jump right in and help them. I do believe that this classroom flipping, this, this information and application moving around is going to be a great thing to help your students understand better. I will tell you that classroom flipping has been around for a while. It started at MIT back in the late 90s, interestingly enough, by a physics professor. It spread in the high school about uh, four or five years ago. And there's now something like four or 5,000 classrooms that are teaching this way. And generally what they've seen is that the understanding level goes through the roof. And that's, that's wonderful because right now I believe I'm just barely kind of chipping away at what students thought was true about physics. Uh, and so I think this is going to give me an opportunity to do a much, much better job of making them understand the physics. Um, a few things that you need to know about all this, um, and this is, the, your students will know this too. Typically, tests count for 70% of this grade, and we're going to have that test on March 23rd. Uh, that is roughly two weeks from now. It is the last day before spring break, and I don't like stretching a unit over spring break because then we got to spend all that time kind of getting back up to speed. So. On Friday, the last Friday before they get out for spring break, there will be a test in here that amounts to 70% of the grade. I've already made up the test. I know right now what I'm going to be asking them, so I'm going to work very hard at making sure I don't surprise them with anything. The rest of the grade is going to be task. Uh, that makes up 30%, and this is where I need your help. There are six tasks that they have to do. Some labs, some virtual uh, circuit design, uh, a number of problems. Uh, all of those things are going to need done prior to the day of the test, and it's going to be kind of self-paced. I'm going to guide them along, but I'm a little worried that some of the students that have trouble staying on task are going to have great trouble staying on task with this. So I'll tell you that on PowerSchool, there will be six tasks, and th the moment I put them up, I'm going to record zeros for all of those. As your student turns in that task, or completes that task rather, that zero will become a hundred. So you should be able to keep track in power school um, how they end up doing. So if they end up doing five out of six tasks, then their grade for that 30% will be five sixths of 30%. Didn't mean to go all math on you there. What I need from you is make sure that they don't get behind. If they get behind, then they will do lousy on the test and everybody loses and then this experiment will be a failure and, and none of us need that. Um, let me tell you about what I'm 
excited about and what I'm a little concerned about. Um, the pros to this thing is much, much better understanding. All the data indicates that um, understanding is going to go through the roof. Students love when we do labs, and really we just don't have the time to do labs because I'm spending all my time not just teaching, but reteaching the same information. So I do believe this is going to free up a lot of time for labs, and your kids really enjoy that. I enjoy that too. Um, and then number three, um, I will be able to do much more individualized attention. If there's someone who's really struggling, we'll have class time so that I can then uh, work with them individually and, uh, and hopefully get them a little further up to speed. Uh, lastly, cons. I'm worried about student accountability. If a student decides to blow off some of the task, they're going to do really, really poorly. And, um, and so I just want everyone to know up front that this could be an abject failure. I hope not. But, um, but if you would please be so kind as to make sure just to stay in the loop and see how they're doing with all of this. Uh, let me say that um, below this, right down there, <laughs> I have listed some links to some videos about flipped classrooms so you can learn a little more. And I'd like you to, do, um, to fill out just a quick little two or three question survey uh, that will help me stay in better contact with you. Thank you. If you have any questions on that survey, there's a place for you to get me some, some questions. So I would uh, want to know what your questions are. Thank you and so long.